Good evening and welcome to Joseph Cornell's Flushing Meadows, a work of art and mourning. I'm Francis Levy, Ed Nersessi and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. And before we begin the program, I, this is a luscious exhibit, which I'm really excited by and ties in both with this assemblage, uh, you know, discussion and collage discussion and also with our up and coming round table, the lure and blur of the real March 13th, and that has, we're having John Cameron Mitchell, the director of Hedwig and the Angry Itch uh, and Yellow Bus, with Fred Tomaselli, Rick Moody, DJ Spooky, the rapper, <laughs> uh, who's also known as Paul Miller. Uh, so that's an incredible round table, and this is an incredible round table. But before we begin, I just wanted to say something and illustrate this, uh, the fact that what's on the walls here is a really integral and important part of the show. And this is from, this is Eric Edelman's piece. So I was, uh, the show was put up the other day and I kind of started to look at it. And uh, Hallie Conan uh, curated it and, and Adam Ludwig assisted her in that. And this is the artist's statement from the show. And the piece is Temple of Himself by Eric Edelman. An object lesson on the perils of self-obsession. An artist revisiting the past and the art he has used to make finds it changed beyond recognition or understanding. Desperately searching for some comprehensible subject, he begins using the one thing he believes does not change, himself. He creates an endless series of self-portraits, variations on a theme, and surrounds himself with them to protect him from the unfathomable reality outside. In the course of this work, he falls in love with his own productions. Instead of seeing them as, as skins, he will eventually shed. He confuses them with his process, mistaking effect for cause. The self-images, true, false, or half-distorted, form a shell, a personal temple, and world of which he is high priest, king, and sole subject. His mirror vision gives rise to many strange self-delusions. The artist adds to his shell by gradually using up his essence. He diminishes as the shell grows. He never ceases to hope that his work will help him to understand, but he never recognizes the wrong turn he has taken. His search for meaning has become a descent into solipsism and narcissistic obsession. Well, that's in competition with Borges and, and Mr. Kafka also. I think it's better than Borges. <laughs> anyway, so the, the, the idea here is one, it's a wonderful thing. I just got very excited. I wanted you to hear it. The second thing is take a look. It's, it's an incredible show. Maureen Malarkey, Th Fred Tomaselli, Ann Pundike, and Mac Pramo are also in it. Uh, other events. March 2nd, this Tuesday, is Confessional Poetry. Ed Hirsch, Mike Brazilla talking about Berryman, Lowell, and others. And that should be amazing because Ed Hirsch also reads from his own poetry at these events. That's our life in poetry continuing at Philotetes. And then on the 6th, is understanding the placebo effect. Did you want to say anything about that, Ed? Because I know you were pretty excited March about that. March 6th? Yeah, March 6th. March 6th is understanding the placebo effect. Did you want to say anything about that? I thought the date was changed. Yeah, maybe. Is the date changed? The date changed. On placebo? It's in April sometime. OK, it's been changed. But you should, that is up and coming. And I did <coughs> want to make a special uh, thank you to Tony Lobier, who has given us an enormous and tremendous contribution to Philotetes, which has helped us. But we still need, we particularly need the help of individual patrons. We've received two grants, New York State Council on the Arts in Poetry and in Music, Department of Cultural Affairs. We're very grateful for the grant we received from them and from Bloomberg. But Philotetes goes from month to month, and we are getting a lot of support from people. But we need that support. And we need individual support because of the fact that that individual support allows us to pay the rent and the subsistence for the center itself. Uh, actually institutions like Department of Cultural Affairs only fund programming. So that is that. And now I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Matthew von Unwork from, uh, Unworth from our staff, who's going to uh, introduce the other, other, other panelists, okay. and who has been, by the way, the prime mover of this event, getting it going. And uh, it is the director of our film program, too. Take Thank it away, you. Matt. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm just uh, going to introduce the panelists. Uh, My immediate left is Ann Mora, um, who is really the prime mover behind this. And she's the associate curator in the Museum of Modern Arts Department of Film. Ms. Mora has, has, uh, has organized numerous film exhibitions, including Made at MoMA, the inaugural film program to mark the opening of the renovated and expanded museum. She curated the film component of Dali, Painting and Film, recipient of the second place award for best monographic museum show nationally 
from AICA slash USA in 2008. Some of her film ex exhibitions include To Save and Project, the MoMA International Festival of Film Preservation, Happy Birthday, Joseph Cornell, A View from the Vaults, uh, sorry, this is a separate film, A View from the Vaults, New Acquisitions, 112 Years of Cinema, Maisel's Films, Five Decades, Dada on Film, and A Sense of Where You Are, Films from the Collection. Uh, Ms. Mora is active in film education and co-organizes Friday Night at the Movies for MoMA's high school film audience and Watch This, Films for Tweens series. She is a member of the Education Committee of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, the Women's Film Preservation Fund, and the, and the editorial board of The Moving Image. To her left is Eric Edelman. He's a collagist and found object sculptor living in New York City. He has exhibited at the Williamsburg Art and Historical Center, the African Museum, sorry, the American Museum of Natural History, the National Arts Club, Long Island University, and various private galleries. His work is represented in, a, in several private and institutional collections and has appeared in the books The Art of the Miniature and Genius in a Bottle, as well as the monograph Eric Edelman Collages of the Unconscious. He draws material for artwork from his personal collections, which include wood engravings, shells, bones, compasses, wooden shapes, porcelain doll parts, game pieces, etc. To his left is Martin Wilner. Uh, he's an artist living and working in New York City. His current solo exhibition, A Life in Days, is on view at Sparone Westwater in New York through March 20th, so please go see it. His one-person exhibition at Hales Gallery in London, Making History UK, opens in April. His ongoing subway diary, Journey of Evidence Weekly, will be featured in the upcoming CNE uh, Shredder number four. He is also a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College and has a private practice in Manhattan. And to his left, um, and my opposite, is Susan Sheftel. She's a clinical psychologist and child analyst here in New York. She's the first child-only graduate of the Columbia Psychoanalytical Center. Sheftel is now on the faculty at Columbia and at the Columbia Parent Infant Program. She's interested in creativity and childhood, and her paper, The Cosmic Child, the Artwork of Joseph Cornell, and a Type of Unusual Sensibility or Thinking Inside the Box, The Mind that Channels Infinity, will be in the next volume of the Psychoanalytic Study of the Child. Uh, a previous paper, The Children's Books of William Steig, a creative representation of early separation and resiliency, was also published there. Okay, um, we've just seen two films uh, dealing with Joseph Cornell's ideas or relationships to others. One, Rose Hobart, uh, an individual to whom he had no real relationship, but a very complex imaginary relationship, and one, uh, 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 Flushing Meadows, based on, um, tell me her name? Joyce Hunter. Joyce Hunter, with whom he had a relationship that was real, um, but a very attenuated sort. Uh, I open the, uh, the panel with this question. What, if anything, do we learn about the artist's process and mind and life from these different films? And what maybe do we also learn about his art? I open it to anyone. Well, I can give you film curator's point of view. Um, I think, particularly with Flushing Meadows, we know that um, Cornell was in this process of mourning um, after Joyce's death. And Joyce, as I said earlier, was a street kid, a runaway from her home in Pennsylvania. She ultimately was uh, stabbed to death by um, a boyfriend in an SRO hotel somewhere in the Times Square area. Um, and Cornell writes to Rudy Burkhardt, uh, the photographer, that he was preparing a film about mourning. And this was his way of dealing with this process. And um, as an artist, it was his means of expression, his means of working, his grief. And also, as I said earlier, he had spent, this is three years in a row now with um, tragic loss for him. His, his uh, Joyce died, his brother, and then his mother. So it's, it's a process of, of his grief being borne out through his art. Any other reactions to the films or? Uh one thing is that his father died when he was 13, 
um, and he was very close to his father, and life changed radically when after his father's death because their fortunes changed, and then Joseph, who was this very shy, sensitive young guy, you know, sort of had to become the man of the family. And um, I think under any circumstances, he probably would have been temperamentally shy and sensitive, but uh, an awful lot of pressure then sort of came onto his shoulders, having had quite a sort of um, child-friendly life with his parents prior to his father's death. So, you know, mapping on to subsequent deaths was this early loss right as he was sort of about to, you know, go into manhood. <laughs> so that was, a, you know, the, uh, in the background for his mourning processes. I think it's interesting you talk about this child-friendly life. Um, he was very much a Victorian in that way. His family indulged in, in various kinds of um, leisure activities with the children. They were generally activities that the children could enjoy, such as amusement mm -hmm. parks. I mean, he loved going to the Hippodrome. So it was a world, a very, a very um, consistent, very uh, comfortable world until the father passes away. And the father sounds like he was a, a sort of a pretty lively man who, you know, conceivably might have had more characterologic stability than his mother, who may have been a little more self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. What did the father die of? I think it was a rather sudden death. It may Leukemia. have been. Or some kind of, it was something like leukemia. It was some kind of cancer of the blood. It may not have been leukemia, but... He was a textile designer and a bit of a, um, I think the word was used, that he was a bit of a flaneur, someone who you know, very much liked the idea of entertainment and the city and something that Joseph followed in quite well. What do we know about Joseph Cornell's style of relating and relationships to other people? And, and I, I immediately add that you know, this raises the big question in, in applied psychoanalysis of what of what you can actually mm -hmm. learn from right. a person's life uh, in relation to their art. But in, in Cornell's case, I think the question is begged, because here we're looking at these particular images that are, on the one hand, he, he has very profound relationships to people he's never met. Um, and they're filled with their images. Uh, in contrast, we look at, at the work, uh, a, a, a work of mourning of someone he, he actually did know, but her image is totally absent except for uh, that of her gravestone, and you see very different images. So I guess I'm asking two questions at once. What do we know about Joseph Cornell, um, the person, um, uh, and how he, you know, what his relationships were like, and do we see that in any way in these films? My feeling is that we see it in the fact uh, that many of the glimpses in the films of living people are like peeps through, such as a peeping through a screen of foliage at the children. And that bears some formal resemblance to some of his earlier films that we were talking about before, such mm -hmm. as what Mozart saw on Mulberry Street. There are many, many shots of the children of various poorer neighborhoods like Little Italy at the time that he shot these films. And also, um, I suppose, the, the shots of Suzanne Miller in various various mm -hmm. films, who was, I guess, just prepubescent at that point. Sort of an Alice in Wonderland kind of figure. Very for much. Him. Yeah. And there was an idealization, a sort of shy, at a distance, terrified to do anything <clears throat> that possibly would breach the separation between uh, himself and the children. He didn't want to interject himself in, in a certain sense. I think that Cornell's life was, you know, largely affected by the death of his father, and that he sort of, uh, as a young man who was so inhibited and timid, he, you know, the death of his father and the change of circumstances of his family life, I think, led him to become almost encased in amber himself and developmentally, and that his work very much reflects that. The boxes, everything is a moment captured in time. The films are capturing moments. Interestingly, I think it was in his notes when um, Joyce Hunter died that he mentions that she was buried in a box. That you know his life began in mm -hmm. effect when the father was buried in the box, and then it sort of ended, began to end when his dream, his wish to create this idyllic world of his childhood that was always tainted by the re by the you know, pressure of reality, you know, crushed, crashed in on him was when she died, when the brother died, and when ultimately his mother died. 
And also after his father died, he was sent off to Phillips Andover Academy um, as a scholarship student, or, or I think the, the tuition was paid for by uh, his father's employer. And he didn't last very long there. And here was a young man who realized that uh, the, the father is missing from the, the family portrait. And instead of being able to grieve and mourn and reconstitute the family, he's pulled out of the dynamic. And he's an abysmal failure at Phillips and then is sent back to, to New York. But he had also not, he missed a lot of school as a child. I mean, mm -hmm. you think he had had what, you know, we would now call separation anxiety, uh, where he really had trouble leaving home mm -hmm. and would have needed a lot of, you know, he, you know, if he were to be, you know, a child now, probably they, his parents would have brought him for treatment. Um, See you. Uh, that would have been nice. I, well, that's actually the paper that I wrote is about um, a kind of a sensibility of a, a child where there's a kind of cutting edge where, you know, there are certainly difficulties that could predispose towards some kind of, you know, more unfortunate outcome, but extremely sensitive children with extremely, you know, sort of lowered sensory thresholds can also be creative if they are properly understood, but it, it all kind of hinges on being properly understood. And Cornell was kind of always trying to understand others or, un, you know, be involved in his own process, but, you know, he wasn't terribly well understood, I think, by those around him, even his fans. It's also worth um, bearing in mind the story that uh, Deborah Solomon tells in her biography, Utopia Parkway of Cornell, which is that on the day that his, Cornell last saw his father alive, his mother called the children uh, into the room and actually had them look outside as an ambulance was bearing him away and said, well, take a good look at him. That's the last of him you're going to see. <laughs> and that must have had an enormous effect on such a sensitive boy as mm -hmm. Joseph at that age. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems to have been followed by immense disruption. It's not just the, I mean, the loss of a father is, yes. is, is the trauma in and of itself, but. The swindling by a family relative, the uprooting and being forced to move to uh, a suburb of Queens from this relatively palatial home in Nyack, yes. And then he basically spent the rest of his life in that place. Yes. Although Cornell, um, had two sisters. They were, the, the order of birth was Joseph, two sisters, and then his brother Robert. The sisters very much were able to have um, you know, what one might call a regular um, life. Uh, they, they married, they had children, they moved away. Um, and that was something that Joseph could not do and something that his brother Robert, due to his infirmity, could not do. Um, it's interesting, though, that the sisters, and, and one would think that normally it is the role of the female child to be the caretaker, mm -hmm. and here you have um, quite, quite the opposite in this case. Yeah, as soon as they could get away, the <clears throat> girls like it. met and married uh, these gentlemen, uh, Mr. Batchelor and Mr. Benton, mm -hmm. and moved uh, to suburbs of New York. Mm -hmm. And they were chicken farmers? Yes, I think one of them was. Mm -hmm. I forget. Uh, Betty? Betty. Yeah, mm -hmm. Betty Benton and her mm -hmm. husband. Yeah. This might be a stretch out of the mic. But, uh, and, uh, you the first, this? No, because I gave it to Matt. The first, the first um, show we ever, um, film we ever had here was in the realms of the Unreal, the Henry, oh, Henry Garger, Garger show. Are there any comparisons to the, the feel of like Henry Garger, that it, the idealization of childhood, I mean, the stamps that you, uh, you alluded to mm -hmm. before? If, if that was missed downstairs, the, 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 the question of any resemblance between Cornell and, and Henry Darger was raised. I was thinking about that actually uh, for something that one of you was saying because he made, you know, he had this, he was completely isolated and had this mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable fantasy life that was enormous and had, did these pictures of little girls with penises who were in these kind of incredible w wars mm -hmm. with, you know, monsters and other armies mm -hmm. and you know he didn't he uh, also had a loss much earlier I think he lost his he lost everybody but it kind of serially when he was under seven and then mm -hmm. was in an institution yeah. but um, you know he turned to fantasy and had strange ideas about women and sexuality and I think that Cornell clearly his sexuality was kind of split up so that he he, he is, seemed to have some 
interests with real sexuality, but also, you know, had that sort of need to make everything very pristine. And, you know, if, if there was something too sensual, he had to get a lot of distance, like the Lauren mm -hmm. Bacall mm -hmm. things. And with Joyce Hunter, she was could not have been a more inappropriate real life person for him. She was, you know, a young girl, she was a runaway, she was uneducated. And then when he befriended her, she stole from him. Mm -hmm. And she stole nine boxes. And th there w was a lawsuit. And in the end, Cornell dropped the charges and got her out of jail. I mean, he was, it was a, you know, what we might call, you know, a little masochistic or, you know, certainly not this was not any. This, this was all about a fantasy of a person, and he kissed her. Mm -hmm. it's interesting, because the, the, the waitress in Vertigo uh, is the subject of the idealization of the James Stewart character. She's converted. You know, he mm -hmm. takes somebody who was just. A, he's taken from life, and, and that's that's what becomes the uh, the whole object, the whole what the, what the movie creates, actually, a non-existent human being. But I think that the, you know the two poles of the very glamorous and then this kind of non-existent. Those were mm -hmm. Cornell. I mean, mm -hmm. he really, though he was, you know, he had a one-man show at the Guggenheim, and he didn't attend um, and never went to the opening. And he was kind of a non-entity to himself for the story about Dali, where he said, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a nobody. Right. So that I think he experienced, he, he had, people said he had very little narcissism, and yet he had these incredible dreams about women, usually, who were idealized. Well, just the sheer fact of the Marilyn Monroe box, he takes on the role of the custodian. And the custodian, the not only the constellation, but the custodian of someone who was the, the biggest celebrity of yeah. the time that this, this gentleman mm -hmm. on Utopia Parkway is going to rehabilitate right. her. So there seems to be a level of narcissism, but yet one that can never be enacted, really, in any way. Well, the discussion, since we're going so much in the psychological direction, uh, just a couple of observations of mine from this. I'm not very familiar with Joseph Cornell's biography, but from what I heard and what I saw and what you told me, the thing that strikes me is that obsession with women without any real relationship with women reveals tremendous amount of hostility and aggression towards women. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a relationship, you obsess about them as a way of dealing with the tremendous amount of conflicts over your sexual desires, but then the aggression. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand and I agree completely that the father's death was a major event in his life, but just before the father's death, there was the birth of a brother with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Quite a few years past the time of the last birth of the sister. And uh, so there has to be reason why, prior to these events, why he had so much hostility towards women. And the answer, there must be something, must have something to do in his relationship with his mother yes. and in his relationship with these sisters, who in a way came after him. And now I will go a bit more wild than I have been so far and say that it's, as a speculation, one could say that the whole notion of women in the boxes or people in the boxes that he did has something to do with the sisters in the mother's womb. And in the first film, which he has collaged together, but there are many allusions to water, things in the water. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, this is wild speculation, but I, I think those are additional factors in this man's life, which explains why he would go with a woman who is a runaway and who's essentially a bad character, mm -hmm. because that woman is already devalued. So he doesn't to have to do anything, she's devalued. He's going to be the rescuer. Mm -hmm. He's going to save the one who's already had all the aggression directed mm -hmm. to it. Well, you're so accurate about his relationship with his mother. He writes in his diaries, and, and his biographer, Deborah Solomon, says that he and his mother were constantly bickering 
that there could never be an agreement between the two of them, and, and they sort of um, agreed to disagree. But it was a very hostile relationship. I don't know if but he... But he lived with her, right? Yes, they all lived together. Um, I don't know if he actually expresses any hostility towards his sisters because they, they left the home. Um, but the, the person with whom he found the solace and comfort was his brother Robert. When he would come home from work at night, he would help Robert, he would bathe him, he would feed him, he would entertain him. Um, Cornell was a great collector of films himself, and he often showed Robert many of the early films by the Méliès brothers or Lumiere, and um, Robert loved the idea of the trick film. And so that was another means of escape for Cornell, not only, not only repositioning films, but showing the films to his brother. Um, and being a collector. And it was a way of, um, once the mom went to bed at night, a way of having peace within the household. Well, there's the whole question that, that is central to this topic, I think, of, of mourning in, in the making of art, and that all of what's being said is about why, for Joseph Cornell, the process of mourning would be a much more complex uh, process, fraught with ambivalence, fraught with hostility. And that the more uh, resentment and hostility there is in the lost object, the more difficult it is to overcome the loss. He very adaptively was able to turn his frustrations and his ambivalence into his art making. So in that sense, we're in some ways fortunate that he didn't come to consult with someone like myself <laughs> or to, because you know, very much in, I don't know if any of you have read the Menand article in this week's New Yorker about what is grief and what is mourning. Mm. He touches on some of these issues in his sort of meandering process of bashing psychiatry in every possible way. Uh, but nonetheless, we're left with the question of what do you do when someone is suffering? And in some cases, you, if they're, you intervene. In some cases, you let them be artists and create their, their work. You know? Uh, the uh, hypothesis is that if you did intervene, they would not be able to create anymore? Well, not necessarily at all. If, if someone is distressed about something in life, that we should intervene. But he wasn't, he never presented, as far as we know, to anyone. And he managed, actually, overall rather well. He wasn't like Darger. He wasn't a complete recluse mm -hmm. living uh, above a photographer's studio. He, uh, he managed to get his work out. The way. Even though he didn't attend some of his openings, he got to know everyone in the surrealist world and actually navigated it very successfully in his own eccentric way. But he didn't consummate any relationships to your knowledge with anybody? anybody right? No, there are well, rumors. Romantic, real romantic no. relationships, you know, it's, whatever that means. That's right. It's, it's unclear. It's, um, certainly, he pursued relationships with various women who were his studio assistants, such as the performance artist Carolee Schneemann. Oh. Um, he, he, started <laughs> a, um, <laughs> he started a correspondence with her and yeah. knew that she had a series of photographs of, of taken of herself, um, various states of undress. And he asked her if she would trade photographs with him, that he had some photographs that she might like, and in fact, vice versa. And so she began to work with Cornell. And I think in his way, he certainly made his um, sort of um, innocent overtures towards her until one day she brought her boyfriend, James Tenney, the, the jazz musician, to Cornell's house. And, and that really bothered Cornell. So that was the, the end of that. And I don't then, think that should have stopped him. But. Well, but it did. And, uh, and then there was the, the artist. He was a moral man. <laughs> there was the artist Yayo Kusama. Um, and there's some thought that perhaps they had some sort of physical relationship. Um, again, unclear. Uh, there's a great story that um, um, Kusama was in the house with Cornell, and uh, then they went out in the backyard. And apparently, had been kissing, and Mrs. Cornell threw a pot of water. The mother. Oh, the mom. Yes, over the two of them, and you know, and uh, said, "Break it up." And and when um, <laughs> he's how old? Oh, he's probably in his late forties, early fifties at this point. <laughs> And when he may actually have even been older. He may have been older. And, yes. and when Kusama left the house, the mother, I believe, did she do the laundry or any of, uh, I think anything that Kusama may have touched went into the washing machine. So. Actually, the story is, as I remember it, that both she and Robert raised a real ruckus when he came home with, uh, with Yayoi Kusama. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he had to face his whole life was dealing with this mom of his. He, he well, dealt he, with he her. He chose to face it. Yeah. Yes. He stayed there. Yes, that's right. But there's a story in the biography Ambivalence. about he's, he, he tries to approach a young woman, a cashier at a local movie theater, 
whom he gets fond of. And he gets so worked up by the thought of actually bringing her flowers and trying to pay a standard sort of compliment of the day to her that in the end, he scares the hell out of her by throwing the flowers in her face and retreating as fast as he can. <laughs> exactly. So obviously, he was both attracted and repelled by the idea of his own sexuality. And a lot of it had to do, I, I imagine, with guilt that was instilled in him by his mom. And I think he was very hungry for a kind of one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. relationship, which he, in fantasy, was doing all the time. But in reality, there was always you know, interference one way or another. Mm -hmm. And yes. I was thinking about Rose Hobart, that it, it looked to me, I mean, I sort of caught on to this sort of midway through, so maybe it's not correct, that there was an awful lot of two faces together. That we kept mm -hmm. seeing two people looking at each other, and that, you know, in a certain way, maybe he was would have needed more of a kind of dyadic experience to contain this very, very comprehensive and overflowing mind. You know, he had a particular turn of mind. He was very encyclopedic and filled with associations, and you know, would have needed some containment. And he. You know, his boxes are all about containment. Mm -hmm. They're containing things, but um, he had trouble containing. Getting back to something Eric said with that story about the woman who was the ticket seller, um, oftentimes you would find that the ticket booth was outside of the theater on the sidewalk, and the seller was the contained yes. true. within yes. a box. True. Yes. And, you know, it's this the idea of the woman. Here you have a real woman, yet she is contained, and, yes. and it's, it's impenetrable. Yes. In that way, and and uh, you know that was. Um, I, did she actually call the police, or the, the yes, theater I, manager winds up calling the police? I believe she was terrified by Cornell's approach, as mm -hmm. one can readily understand. <laughs> but um, but there she was in her box. There she was, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. Well, so with some of the studio assistants, I think there was one who came to live with him, and, and she described it waking up in the morning, and he would be sort of waiting outside her door. I mean, he was so preoccupied with her. And occasionally passing notes underneath yeah. the door. Yes. He was a bit of a nut. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I mean, quite, but, you know, by, by the time of his death, I mean, he was fairly affluent. Um, and certainly the box is not selling for what they sell for today, but there was little reason for him to live in the way he lived. I mean, if you see photographs of the home, his bedroom was very spartan. There was a single bed with a little um, TV tray table next to the bed. Um, and there was little reason to live without creature comforts. It just, it's this choice to, to be rather monastic, I think. Well, speaking of choice, what do we make of, of the artistic decision he seems to have taken very early to, to, to work with secondhand materials, that there are, no, there are very few original images um, in his work, it is all, it's collage, mm -hmm. it's appropriation. Dali, of course, did go on to make films with very strongly self-created images. So whether or not this story is true, it, 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 it throws into contrast Cornell's method. What, what, if anything, do we make of that, that, his, that he uses, that he is a, a second-hand artist? Well, essentially, that goes back to Anne's comment earlier about him being a Victorian in the modern age, a Victorian in the 20th century, as it were. Uh, many historians consider that the Victorian age extended all the way to at least 1915, <laughs> in uh, somewhere from about the 1840s to about 1915, which was the opening, I think, of one of the exhibitions, the Pan American mm -hmm. Exposition or something like that. Uh, one of the things that Cornell grew up with as a boy was the concept of making things. Everyone in those days, both boys and girls, made things. There were numerous editions that went through of boys and girls handy books and craft books. Everybody knew how to do something. And one of the common uh, pastimes of that time was creating framed shadow boxes and passepartout, mm -hmm. and even creating crystallizations within velvet cases, which is very much something that Cornell may have been involved with. He claimed that he never received any formal instruction in art, and indeed, as a child, he was not considered the talented one of the family. I believe either Betty or Helen was tapped to receive um, art lessons from a young, promising illustrator who lived in Nyack named Edward Hopper. Right. 
great, great fact. Well, collage making in itself was a Victorian pastime. Mm -hmm. There's an exhibit yes. right now at the Met of Victorian era collage, and I'm sure that mm. even though he didn't formally study it, those things weren't formally studied. It was a pastime, and yes. it was a pastime mostly of middle class, mm -hmm. and upper middle class yes. women in Victorian England in particular, and uh, clearly you see the influence. But so were. also was painting and and photography and a number yes. of other things. So what about what what about this particular medium? Do you th is, is there anything that can be said about what, what attracts them to this? Well, immediate accessibility. The fact is you don't have to create an image, as it were, from scratch. You don't know how to draw, how to, you don't have to know how to draw an adequate arm or a leg or a portrait. You can take things that you find from many sources and actually create them. Stamp mosaics in which people create beautiful mosaic-like effects mm -hmm. using uh, engraved postage stamps of various types that they would cut up. Quilling, where you would take tightly rolled uh, strips of paper and create a decorative effect by gluing them on end on a paper. All of these things are means of making art that uh, in which you can stand on someone else's shoulder. Someone has created the image for you, collage and you can begin immediately. You don't have to wait for tuition or say to yourself, oh, I really stink at drawing, and I'll never get anywhere doing this. Well, I think also his life had a strikingly before and after kind of element to it, before his brother was born, before his father died, the quality of life, the fact that he was sent into exile right after his father died. So I think using collage, I think psychologically, must have appealed to him in that it was a way of taking things from the past and bringing right. it into mm -hmm. his present world continuously. And to create something original would actually work against that wish of his to relive or recreate a world of his past, an, an idealized world from his past. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, I mean, I think, you know, you said he's a nut, which, you know, in a way, I mean, the net out is he seemed like a nut. But I think, you know, as a, he was an incredibly sensitive child mm -hmm. who was so, almost sort of participated in every sensory experience that, you know, he had. And I think he had a feeling of always wanting to capture the moment and feeling like it was always getting away from him, which clearly was multi-determined. But, but there was, a, and you may be able to get the quote better, but there was a moment he used to, he used to like collecting things and he would take walks around New York mm -hmm. and he would go to uh, used bookstores and thrift shops and he, he, he had, he was walking past a window that had, I think, compasses in it. Mm -hmm. And he suddenly thought, everything can be used. Wait, do you remember the quote? It's I don't remember the quote, but I, I know the, the compass being this kind of, this ability to root oneself, but right. yet always having the ability to, to kind of travel out of that path. Right, but he, he, he felt like you could almost use anything yes. mm -hmm. with anything. And if you presented it in a certain way, and I, I was thinking also watching the um, film that Rose Hobart, that, you know, an infant, um, you know, some of the stuff that's been done about infancy, you know, the, it's, ta it's talked about that the mother can sort of mark the baby's experience. The baby starts crying hysterically. The mother should not become hysterical. She can mark it by saying, oh, I know you're very upset, and sort of acknowledge it, but, but helps contain. And I think one of the things he was doing was marking in that way that we talk about in infancy, marking things. And with Rose Hobart, you know, mm -hmm. sort of this strange B movie, but he p makes it blue, he splices it, and we're suddenly fascinated by something that we might otherwise be rather disinterested in. So mm -hmm. he was almost doing on his art what he might have wished could have been done for him. And I, I think also with Rose Hobart, it, it, the fact that he has this strange samba music that he's playing with it, to me, I, I can, you know, the whole idea of him bickering with his mother, it's almost as if he had his own soundtrack yeah, going yeah, in yeah. his head while his mother was yapping and, you know, something else is playing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that he takes a film, a, a sound film from 1932, and takes away all of its sound characteristics and imprints on it with this, yeah. this exotic music, but exotic from a very different way from, from what you see in the film. And it's on a loop. It keeps playing and playing these two, perhaps three different samba songs. And it's, uh, you know, this, this kind of duality in a way, something that, is, that already has its sound elements, mm -hmm. but he does something else with it. 
Doesn't that remind you of Jack Smith a little bit? We did yes. Jack Smith here. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I was, it's very weird to sort of bring this up. You mentioned Carol Lee, you know, mm -hmm. and that and that. But, but here you have these boxes, and yet, yet I, my whole, it's from the minute this the whole thing started, it's with performance art, early performance mm -hmm. art, you know, right. in the 60s and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. We used to introduce all these kind of surrealist elements, infatuation with the with silent cinema and the mm -hmm. grandeur of the past cinema, you mm -hmm. know, these kind of these kind of these kind of elements of imagery, you know, uh, but not like surrealism really. Because not mm -hmm. the, such explicit aggression, such explicit sexuality, much more muted, mm -hmm. uh, you know, qualitatively. He gets pulled into the surrealism. I think it's more, it's more happenstance by the time of his exposure to the art world than than true surrealism. Um, you know, surrealism, of course, being an art form that that deals with a heightened sense of dreams, and I think. Yes, Cornell deals with dreams, but there's these very personal obsessions yeah. more than anything else. The, the movie had a lot of sexuality in it, I thought. The, the Rose Hobart. Yeah. Do you yes. love the volcano? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. And also the, the rings of this, you know, these objects <laughs> penetrating the water. And then and you have these women with these guys with the mm -hmm. representation of manhood. Mm -hmm. Well, his, I mean, well, Flushing Meadows as well. There was these shots, close shots of, of roses, oh, yes. and then followed by these phallic monuments. Yeah. And, yes, mm -hmm. the obelisks. The obelisks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say. I mean, a lot of people seem to have a very strong relationship to Cornell's work, mm -hmm. and it seems to me it's it, it for many people it may be easier to identify with, than say the work of the surrealists. It, it seems the boxes seem to. To, to lend themselves to making meaning, especially if you start with objects of popular culture that we all have some relationship to already. And it's very, it's very clear that they're, they're construed in a very personal way, but they're also objects that we all have, I mean, or at least images that we, that we all have some relationship to, as opposed to a soupy clock that's you know, running down. That actually goes back to your earlier question about why these appropriated art forms as opposed to why not painting and drawing <clears throat> is the fact that they carry a sort of cultural collective unconscious, a kind of ancestral memory, if you wish, mm -hmm. among all of us. And uh, you definitely find that in a lot of the objects and images that Cornell used. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, the two things that, uh, that strike me are that, yes, it, it, it offers a kind of intertextuality um, or a, Associate, associativity, but it also sort of hollows out the individual sense. I mean, that's not, of course, true at the, at the most profound depth. But he's not there. It's 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 he's there in an, in the negative. But these are um, it's, it's it's very different than say the true surrealist images, which are very self-expressive. Yeah. Yeah. He's not there as a filmmaker either. And not only does he appropriate in a film like Rose Hobart, but when he's actively making films, he's not actively making films. He hires Stan Brakhage, one of the greatest avant-garde experimental American filmmakers, Larry Jordan, who shot the film Flushing Meadows, or Rudy Burkhard. Cornell did not pick up the camera. He would either send them out with copious notes as to what he was looking for, um, shoot 20 feet of uh, pigeons drinking water from fountain, or he would, as I believe he is there during the making of Flushing Meadows, and he's telling Larry Jordan what he wants shot. What did Brackett shoot? Um, several films, and I think the one that's probably most interesting is Centuries of June, with children uh, walking past this um, Victorian home that's being torn down. Hmm. Also a famous film, I think, called Gunir Red Now. Right. Wonder Ring Backwards, which is a memorialization of the Third Avenue L. Wow. The interesting story with that is that he had sent Brackage out to shoot the film, and uh, Cornell didn't like what he got. And so Stan said, I think I'm going to finish working on this, and I, I will you know, make it part of my own work. And so there is a film called Wonder Ring in the Brackage filmography, and Cornell got a little miffed with that. And so he shows the film in reverse, and he reverses the title to Guinea Red Now. Yes. The entire, fil the entire film is shown end to beginning rather than beginning to end. Great. And I can tell you, every time we show that film at MoMA, the there's, yes. you know, I get all kinds of notes, um, uh, angry notes from our visitors. Don't your projectionists know that films shouldn't be <laughs> backwards or upside down? And so. That's a fantastic story. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I think part of the appeal of Cornell so broadly is that his work explicitly taps into childhood, into the ambivalence of childhood, the loss of innocence, and that the, uh, many of the boxes, if not all, are really were made to, as games. They were meant to be handled, they were meant to be played with, and they had parts that moved and they were, they were intended to move. And of course, as they became more valuable and more appreciated by the art world, so to speak, they became encased in stone, so to speak, in museums and institutions so that you don't get to play with them. I had the opportunity because I had met James Corcoran, who represented the estate for a period of time, and I got to play with some of the boxes. And it's mesmerizing. It's a completely different experience when you actually get to handle the box and open the drawers and move the different parts around. And they're meant to, at some level right. to be played with. Yes. They, they were advertised as um, toys for adults. When Julian Levy first tried to sell the work, it was around Christmas time. Yes. And in, what was it, 35 or something? Yes. And uh, they were advertised in that way, which Cornell was not happy with. He, he felt it was a denigration of the work in some way, but went along with it because here was this uh, the most prominent surrealist gallerist, well, maybe the only one at that point, actually, um, who was selling the work. One of the things was that he was very unhappy with the slighting and dismissive way that the, um, the shows were reviewed. And they were, they were actually dismissed as sort of toys for adults or little baubles, little bagatelles that people could waste a little money on as, as gifts or relatives. And Cornell actually was in business for a while creating those daguerreotype-like boxes uh, from people's photographs that he did with that wonderful one of Greta Garbo in profile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was meant to simulate the look of a 19th century right. daguerreotype. But I think the toy aspect, I mean, there is a sub subspecies of artists who tap right into childhood. Yes. And I think that many of them did have sort of stunted um, relationship lives. I mean, if you think of, you know, J.M. Barry um, or um, somebody else came to mind. And I actually, when we were talking now, I was thinking a little bit of Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. which seems like a very banal comparison, but really if, if you saw the movie of This Is It, you know, of his last tour, people have a kind of reverential experience of Michael Jackson because Michael Jackson really was tapping into something um, that was uh, something to do with childhood. Of course, he started as a child. Mm -hmm. And I think there's not that many artists who can fully represent childhood. And the ones who are good at it strike such an unconscious chord in people. Oh, your uh, man Tim Burton, I think, falls mm -hmm, into that yeah. category. Oh, right, because mm -hmm, you have that exhibit mm -hmm. there. There's yeah. also Hans Christian Andersen, right. who was famous for two things. Nowadays, he is anyway. Uh, he's famous for his fairy tales, which often have a strong, hostile, and masochistic and sadistic streak to them. <laughs> But there's also the fact that uh, his behavior with women, he used to pay prostitutes to basically undress in front of him while he sat there and viewed them. Mm -hmm. But he became outraged if anyone ever imputed the least bit of sexuality to this person. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that in, in connection with your remarks about the, the pieces being games, that in many of Cornell's uh, boxes, there are explicit references to childhood that uh, are not so well known nowadays, but would have been common when he was a kid. His mother was trained as a kindergarten teacher. And of course, kindergarten was started by the great German uh, philo phil philosopher, educational theorist, Friedrich Froebel. And Froebel created a whole series of kindergarten gifts and activities to give out to children. So you'll see in many Cornell boxes, there are hanging spheres, or spheres that are pierced through, or cylinders that are hanging. In the custodian uh, box mm -hmm. for MM, Marilyn Monroe, in the corner of the box hanging from a steel rod is a cylinder. That was actually a reference to the second kindergarten gift of Friedrich Froebel. That was also pointed out by Linda Rostigo Hardigan, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that a lot of his boxes reference his specific playthings that his parents would have bought him. As wealthy parents, they would have bought him the complete set of kindergarten gifts and mm -hmm. activities. I guess we're, we're about ready for questions, but I, I did, um, I'm curious if, if, if there's any way to bring into the discussion Joseph Cornell's faith, because Joseph Cornell was a Christian scientist wow. um, and a very devout one, and those images play, and I, I know you know a little bit about this, but I wonder if anyone has anything they could share with us um, before, we, before we open it up to questions. 
Well, you know, I just want to say that before you say it, that when we were talking before, I had been struck by the fact that though he was so devoted to his brother Robert, when Robert died, he did not attend the funeral because the mother was out in Long Island and wanted company, couldn't make her way up to Nyack. So he went and stayed with his mother while the sisters went to the funeral. Now, this is very complicated because he was so, so close to his brother. But you were saying that this may have had something to do with Christian Science. I mean, at at one level, that that he didn't, you know, that he didn't go was might have even been related to how people feel about funerals in the religion. Yes, it's somewhat conjectural on my part, but Christian Science as a religion distinguishes between two kinds of matter in the universe. There's divine ma mind, and the images of the universe in which everything is eternal and perfect and beautiful. And there's mortal mind, which is the source of all conflict, crime, disease, death. Francis. Sexuality, as it were. <laughs> so all of that is said to come from the, mor the mortal aspect. But as a result, many Christian scientists, and I hope I'm not treading on toes here, forgive me if I am, uh, for those of you who may be adherents of the Christian science faith, many Christian scientists dispute the existence of death. Death is not said to be real. So to the end of his life, Cornell was fond of actually talking to people who were long dead. Right. The ballerinas, Marie Taglioni mm -hmm. and Fanny Cerrito, mm -hmm. his brother, his, his, his mother, people like that. He didn't accept that they were gone. He used to write them letters and communicate mm -hmm. with them. Great. Was, he, was his family Christian scientists? No. It was only he himself who was Christian scientist. He became one after an experience of healing from severe uh, stomach cramps that I think were the result of anxiety, some sort of anxiety disorder that he was prey to as a young man. I don't know about that. Come on up. You want to come up to the mic? We, the, no one can hear you unless you're on that mic there. Uh, when I was uh, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, yeah. keep, keep in mind, there are people downstairs that can't hear you. Yeah, so. they can't. Go to that mic. Yeah, okay. that's good. And, and, and let us know who you are, actually. Yes. Brief remark. I'm Marianne Coors, and I edited Cornell's diaries and letters and source files. And I had to get permission from the Christian Science Church in order to publish the letters that he'd written to his mother, who was in the sky. Uh, ditto his brother, and I remember that very clearly. I was terrified because... You know, I'm not a Christian scientist, though I tried to be one. And the fact that I tried to be one put me in good odor with the church, as it were. But there were amazing things about doing those, those letters and source files. And one more remark about Carolee Schneemann. She said that when she was posing for him, and he said, would you take off your clothes? She said, sure, if you'll take off yours. <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> Were there letters to his father? No. No. Interesting, just as Mo. And about surrealism, let me just say that the surrealists were anathema to Joseph Cornell because he said he did white magic and they did black magic. Wow. Yes, <laughs> great point. Thank you so much. Thank you. So please uh, come up if, if anyone has a question. Do identify yourself and do speak into a microphone because. There are people watching on the internet and also downstairs. Um, I'm Anne Marie Levine. I have two questions. Um, one, no one's mentioned Duchamp, Marcel Duchamp, and, um, and his connection. And during the war, Duchamp was here and he hired Cornell to make things for him, uh, to construct things for him. And Cornell apparently used to empty the waste baskets of Duchamp's detritus, whatever he had thrown away, and take home. And I think, you know, I think it's, th their connection is really very interesting because Duchamp is perhaps the father of appropriation and loved found objects, and found objects is what we've been talking about very much. So I, I don't know, nobody said anything, so I thought I should say something. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, um, um, what do you all think about um, this impulse to collect, uh, to have archives? Also, no one has mentioned you know, that his house was full of shoe boxes, full of detritus and things he collected and things that might turn up in his boxes or might not. It, it, I gather it was a god-awful mess. But I mean, why wouldn't it be? But, but is this some sort of hedge against loss, um, as so many other things might be, I mean, from a psychological point of view? 
A, to mention it, and B, to see what you think of it. <laughs> Thank you. You, you. Brought to mind, we did a roundtable on Bob Dylan earlier, and we did not talk about the Weberman tapes about the fellow who went through Bob Dylan's garbage oh, for yeah. years and years as a way of being closer to him. And eventually, there's, there, Bob Dylan had a telephone conversation where he said some very mean, angry, appropriately angry things about it. But there too, someone is trying to, you know, there's the, there are ways of trying to approach the object that are not necessarily the direct route. I think um, going through Duchamp's garbage is you know, probably not a bad starting place to <laughs> identify with. It's perfect. But they knew each other. In fact, uh, there were letters, I think, after his mother died from Duchamp's wife, and they were friendly, and they were in shows together at the Julian Levy Gallery. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And as the lady mentioned, actually, Duchamp employed him to construct his Box in a Valise mm -hmm. series, which was a miniature museum. Mm -hmm essentially a pastiche of all the major work Duchamp created as an adult artist. And it is true, they had, they had a relationship in, in that way. Um, I think, once again, that that speaks a lot to what, what uh, Ms. Cause brought out, which is the conflict between black and white magic with the surrealists. Cornell used to complain incessantly about the, the uh, language that Duchamp would push at him because Duchamp was famous for uttering four-letter words and watching Cornell jump back at the impact of them. <laughs> Hi, Gail Marks. Um, those films were so visually gorgeous. Now, I don't know what Brackage um, was instructed to look at in the cemetery film, but the way that he focused on an image and stayed with it is so much like what young artists are doing right now. And the mm -hmm. first film, Rose Hobart, this gorgeous woman, and she's changing her dress and he's interspersing different scenes. And to me it was like he is Rose Hobart so intensely and lovingly and fantastic. <laughs> That's, I don't know. You're nodding. I don't know well, I think, whether you, you know, feel the same. It's an in, Rose Hobart, the actress, is sort of interesting for her time because she's she's rather androgynous looking, and um, well, she has short hair, well, but, but otherwise, she, well, no, but she wears. You know, you see her wearing the man suit, the man suit. and all of that, and then when she there is this transformation into the to the beautiful evening gown. Um, I think that had it been a more womanly woman. Um, there may have been less of this uh, obsession mm -hmm. for Cornell. Um, with the, the second point, the, the film was shot by Larry Jordan and uh, Flushing Meadows, and it's, it's hard for us to know exactly what the instructions were, but... Um, was you know, he there? Was Cornell at the we shoot? I be believe yeah. he was there. I believe he was there and is telling Jordan exactly what he wants shot. And I, I, particularly the, the image with the mother walking with the little boy, and the I carriage. was more struck by the trees and, and the, the trees, light. The, the color Beautiful. of the roses. I and mean, there's a lot of dark and light. And it's yes. not necessarily just that transfer. When you actually see the original film, which is in the MoMA collection, you see those various densities. And I do think that it was about coming through this darkness. And then at, when, when the grief and the mourning have concluded, there is this sort of the new day. And I think that's very much what he's working through, um, because also he was the only person mourning for Joyce Hunter. Mm -hmm. Did he? Did, was there a funeral for Joyce Hunter? No. I mean, it's. It's. Uh, I feel like we may have given the films a little bit of short shrift because those images in Flushing Meadows, is, you know, there's for a film of mourning, it's it's very vibrant. I mean, the the, the images are very much of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. there you can find allusions to death certainly, but there's. There's a, yep. there's and they're very rich. It's not like the little house that he lived in in Flushing. That's it's true. Rich. You know, I, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but I, I heard learned a little about Flushing, Flushing's history recently. Was it, it began as a Quaker colony, I think, right, or a Quaker town, and um, it actually had origins earlier in in the Dutch community. The name comes from listening which is, I guess, a Dutch word. And um, it's very much an old community. I think it's almost four or 500 years old and it's settlement by Caucasians, by Europeans. One, one thing I wanted to add about the, uh, the remark about the richness of Rose Hobart, P. Adams Sidney in the yeah. piece that he wrote in the Cornell retrospective of MoMA 
talked about the fact that the, um, the film Rose Hobart was shown on a specially modified projector that had been adapted to the needs of silent film. Silent film was shot at 18 feet per second. Mm -hmm. Modern film was shot at 24 feet per oh, frames. frames per second, right. excuse me, not mm -hmm. feet. And so when you show a modern film on this slower projector, it gets a kind of languid quality. Did you notice how slow her mm -hmm. movements were yeah. that in the introductory scene where she's seen walking toward the mm -hmm. camera, her dress billows but does so very slowly and languidly and sensually. Also, the, the concept of photographing it through a blue filter is very much akin to the early silent movie practice of using colored glass to project the film through to project different moods. So for example, for evening, they would project it through a blue glass, mm -hmm. for interiors through a Van Dyke brown glass. For exterior shots in the wild, they might project it through a green glass. So Cornell was very familiar with all of that material as a silent film aficionado. But the short, actually the, the less frames makes it speedier seeming, doesn't it? No, actually um, what happens is it actually slows it down. In special effects, you might have noticed this when you see an explosion. An explosion in, in special effects like the volcano, they always shoot more film than they need. It's called overclocking. Because if you were to shoot it in regular time, boom, mm -hmm. and it's over with. They make it sort of, they stretch it out by shooting more film than they need. Yeah. Go ahead. And just to add, if there are people downstairs with questions, please come up and come to a microphone. As someone who lost my father when I was 13, I was interested in the <coughs> idea of someone who is hit with this early trauma and then what they make of it. And you touched on this a little bit, that in this case, he used that in an artistic way and did something that now leads you all to be fascinated by him rather than just being a, a destroyed, kind of devastated person and, and being a sad figure. Can you talk a little bit about, about the connection and how that worked for him, and, and, you know, where it led to creativity instead of the opposite? <laughs> I think there were many splits in him, unfortunately, and fortunately, you know, that I think that on the one hand, he was, I mean, he was very, very gaunt, he was very sweet, and particularly near the end of his life, he ate very little, and he, you know, looks, if you see the pictures, he looks incredibly forbidding and depressed, but almost all accounts, um, and, and this is why he's not really a nut, he's something else, all accounts say he had the most incredible presence. You felt enlivened when you were with him. He, he was so sensitive. He was incredibly kind. I almost get the, you know, you read things about the Dalai Lama. You know, when you're in his presence, you mm -hmm. feel something. You're participating in something. And there are account after account after account of people feeling he had something almost magical about him and was incredibly good with children. And children liked him. So there's a kind of a split between that sort of ravaged part and then this incredibly enlivened part, which also probably mirrors the split between his um, puritanical renunciations and his sexuality and aggression. They were around. You know, he was even able to make a kind of, you know, uh, revengeful joke, mm -hmm. but they weren't, but they also terrified him. So I think he was extremely split. And that was a problem. And that maybe was even a problem for the processes of mourning that he had to experience. There, there's another thing that comes into this, too, which is that, as everybody has remarked at one point or another, it's extraordinary the extent to which Cornell doesn't mention his father from the time of yes. his death yes. all the way to his own death. That's and so uh, there's also a very famous montage in which a profile photo of his father is superimposed next to Cornell's profile in his 60s. And of course, as with genetics um, taking hold, it's, it's really an amazing resemblance. I sense that what happened was that Cornell, becoming the man of the house, and this is only a private thesis, so you can take it with a large shaker of salt. Uh, I sense that the reason why he didn't mention his father so much was that he, in a sense, became his father. In a certain sense, he stepped into not only his father's shoes, but literally, I think, he absorbed his, what he knew and loved of his father into himself. That's 
as he I worked, said, a pro. He worked in the same industry. He worked in the textile industry yes. for a short period of time, doing much of the same kind of work that his father did. And, and, um, for about from, 10 years, yeah. Yeah, and from time to time, he would come across people in that field who knew his father. And so there was this you know, connection. Not only, not only did he resemble his father, he was doing the same kind of work. With the kind of work, actually, it wasn't the work was not by choice. His mother got him his first job, in a in a textile situation. Yes, yes, with Coonhart Textile. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to get back to part of your question was, how does unless I misunderstood was how does someone become an artist in effect versus <laughs> becoming a failed person as yeah. a result of some kind of terrible trauma? That's a kind of a big question, and there's a lot of things that go into creativity and creativity as a psychological force, as a sublimation of many traumatic experiences, oftentimes and unpleasant experiences, if not at the level of trauma that we sometimes think of uh, and you know, so forth. I mean, uh, you know, one of my major projects in my own work began immediately in the aftermath of September 11th. So the event, personal events and world events shape what you do as an artist. If you have that proclivity, it often confers certain hopeful advantages that you, of dealing with things that otherwise are difficult to deal with in life. But there are other ways of dealing with the, you know, the challenge of life is what do you do with the cards that you're dealt. And if you can successfully adapt in some way, then you can grow from the uh, you know, experience. And if not, you're faced with all kinds of difficulties. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Hi. My name is Alex Stimmel. Um, so I thank you, everyone, for, for all. There's a lot of thought-provoking stuff here. but. I, you know, we've spoken a lot about Cornell as maybe fixed in childhood some way, maybe like pre-trauma of his father dying or something, or um, also fixing other people with his childlike desire to keep things as they are in the present and not move forward. We've also spoke about him being absent from a lot of his works, but then, Eric, you mentioned these sort of kindergarten spheres and things which make it seem like maybe he is very present in the work. Um, and just to return to Flushing Meadows for a second, you know, I, I like the scene of the mother or the son putting the little baby pushing the pram or whatever. But actually, I would posit that maybe Cornell is present in the next scene with the children where he's saying goodbye to these yes. two figures, you know, a, a boy and a girl, maybe his father and Joyce Hunter, the two people who had these traumatic losses mm -hmm. from who he actually never got to say goodbye to. Um, and Sorry. if he's this child saying goodbye to them, it's just this, you know, if he's yeah. with her. The two individuals sitting on the bench? No, no, there's a scene where, where, there's, a, where there's a sister and a younger brother, okay. and they're saying goodbye to this kid, and, and the baby almost has this, like, it's goodbye, goodbye, kind of this childlike yes. look for a second. And um, it was really interesting to me because there's so little, there's living things like trees and roses, and, but there's so little humanness in the movie that since we're talking about grief, which is an, pretty much an extremely human emotion, almost specifically, like, it seems that there is... That, that would be the one human element that he's really seizing on, so I was interested in your you know, interpretation of that. It's funny that you mentioned that, because I was very struck by that and then completely forgot it. And, it, and until you mentioned it, it sort of went, went away, but it's incredibly poignant. The, there's a little wave, a little bemusement on the part of the baby, and I think that it's very hard to tolerate little children's grief and little children's upset. And of course, children feel grief not just with death, but also just with certain goodbyes. And I think it's... In, very overpowering, even for grown-ups, and it is interesting that that was such a powerful thing, and it had just gone right out of my mind. <laughs> and it may be that Cornell was so sensitive that it was really like being in someone who embodied these qualities, but he was a grown-up, and he seemed to be, you know, in charge of his own life. But actually, I don't think he was. That was his tragedy, and he, very few people even came to his funeral. So. Just to rephrase what you said, it's really the way we learn to say goodbye is the way we learn to grieve. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's true. So true. Did you have a question? Uh, I have a comment, and I also have a question. As I was sitting here learning things that I didn't know about Cornell's mother being a kindergarten teacher, and also that she used the Froebel material, I was thinking of Frank Lloyd Wright, because his mother when she got his room set up before he was born, said he was going to be an architect and put things in the crib and had the Froebel and thought of Christopher Wren and all of those things. We also said in today that he didn't mention anything about his father from the death until his own death. We know very little bit. Think of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's mother. Nobody ever thinks about his father. Nobody ever thinks about Frank Lloyd Wright's father, although he was very also influential 
in his life in terms of music, the mother giving him those, those early um, cubes and cylinders of Froebel and some of the other early educators, because they were all educators, um, the lasting influence was that he always thought in geometric forms. And even when he did the Guggenheim, it was a conch shell. So I'm thinking of organic processes that the children have early in life through the parents. And when their own development comes up, it starts to take off with the environment. I live in the village for umpteen years. And we have something called cop art. You cop everything you take, and you put it together. And so it's maybe different than Schwitter's or different kinds of collages, but young people appropriate things, and they think it's perfectly fine. I don't think they're as uh, aesthetic and contained as Cornell, but when I think of it being a box, he was very boxed in. He was so boxed in, that became his form, a containment. And I don't know whether I'm, this is just conjecture or any of you feel uh, any of this is valid. Thank you. Well, late in life, um, someone made a remark to Cornell, and his answer was, he all of a sudden looked very melancholic, and he said, you have no idea what it is like to be trapped in boxes your whole life. So you, you're bang on the mark with that remark. Um, Matt, 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 just one piece on this. Matt, Matt, maybe we can close it here. That you wrote a whole, you've written a whole book on mourning inspired by a passage from Freud. Does any, and, and, and the subject is mourning today. Is there anything about your book that you would apply to uh, any of the you know, thoughts that were in your book that would apply to the, to the discussion of Cornell today? Um, well, thank you for asking, but I, I think I think it's mostly been covered. I mean, it, it's clear that Cornell, you know, certain conflicts and certain feelings remained fixed in him, and he was able to draw on them as a source for inspiration his whole life. It is, as has been said, it's possible that had he had more successful relationships um, and found a way into the world that way, we might not have this material. I think, I mean, this is a, it's an eternal conundrum. It doesn't mean that he might not have been doing other wonderful art or some other wonderful work, but this work clearly seems to echo what was going on in him, sometimes in ways he was able to articulate and others that he may have even denied that were going on in him. And there, I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's part of what makes this work so compelling that uh, in some ways its meaning is concealed and deeply per personal, but in other ways it seems very much to communicate uh, to people who, because in some measure, we all share uh, aspects of, of these conflicts and aspects of mourning. Um, I think there's something very powerful. Anytime you see a picture of, you know, we see all these magazines on, in, in, the, in, the, in the grocery stores, and to see someone who has made it their own in some way, even if we can't really understand what's going on, I think it, it communicates something. It's a, it helps us enter the world. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. Thank Again, I tell you what, um, if you can still hear me, we're gonna, for those that want to, we're going to show just Flushing Meadows one more time downstairs. Um, you don't have to stay, but do. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you, MoMA, for letting us show it. I knew Carol. Thank you.